Well, my name is not Oscar Muriu, um, but I have the privilege of introducing a friend, a brother, and a pastor. Um, it was my privilege to come to Wheaton 14, almost 14 years ago, and it turns out that Pastor Oscar is the bookends of my time here. He was the first person I introduced in this chapel, and he spoke at that time on the need for the North American church to acquire new lenses, um, to see the churches of the global south, the majority world, in new ways, to understand what, Christian, what God was doing through Christians in different parts of the world and to come alongside of them in new ways. Today, he's going to be speaking us again, or just to us again on the themes of partnership. What has the church, both here and in other places, learned in the last 14 years or so? One of the last things it was my privilege to do in Kenya was to serve as an elder at Nairobi Chapel, um, Oscar's church. It may sound unpretentious, and indeed, the beginning was. Um, I remember when Oscar took um, over at Nairobi Chapel, when he was called to that by its elders, it was a small group meeting in a very small church that, ca that maybe would seat 200 people, but there were only 20 people in it at the time. Oscar was called out of the Nairobi Evangelical Graduate School of Theology um, to come and bring its fresh spirit to that. And Oscar, in the spirit, brought a change to that church. By the time I left in 1999, there were over 3,000 people meeting in a church that originally sat 200. Today, there are 28 churches that have been planted by Nairobi Chapel with an aggregate congregation of well over 14,000, not only in Kenya, but in Uganda, um, in Australia, and soon to be in Germany, and about five or six other African countries have a v vision to plant churches. Oscar is one of those people who is so unpretentious, and yet he is a visionary, unlike almost anyone I have ever known. He's committed to worship. He's committed to witness. His core is centered in discipleship. He's, he's committed to engaging the church around the world. Um, he's talking about partnerships that are multi-directional. -direct His theme is, is, is multiplication. When I was leaving, we were struggling with what to do with Nairobi Chapel because we had well overreached the limits of the chapel's ability to, to operate on a small piece of land. And so as elders, we made the very painful decision that we would build a megachurch in Nairobi. It was not to be. The Lord simply did not open that door. So what did Oscar and the elders decide to do? They decided not to become bigger, but become more. Replication, multiplication, and that has been their strategy ever since to give away leadership, to, to multiply leadership, and to give it away. This is a leader who gives leadership to others, an example for our time. Oscar, would you come and speak to us? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's been a whole 14 years since I last stood here before a different set of students 14 years back, but uh, it's a joy to be back here with you. I stand before you as an African church leader, a simple pastor of a local church in the heart of Africa in Nairobi, Kenya. But I do so to tell you that these are exciting days and times we're living in. Exciting because the Spirit of God is moving in the global south in new ways, in mighty ways and amazing things are happening in our part of the world. These are exciting days because the way we do missions is changing. The majority church in the Southern Hemisphere is learning to speak with its own voice and to dream a new dream of full participation in the task of missions alongside the church in the Western Hemisphere. I can only give you a picture of what's happening in Africa, but I want to do so by sharing with you three things, paradigm shifts that you need to make, because as we see the changes that are happening in the global south, you are going to be the generation that is going to navigate the leadership of the church in the Western Hemisphere as you relate to us in the Southern Hemisphere. And so I stand before you today to plead with you, change your perspective of the global south and what is happening there. Let me begin to explain. One of the perceptions that many in the Western Hemisphere have about Africa is that it is a poverty-ridden, dark, miserable, dysfunctional continent. But you need to change from that perspective to a new one. 
that Africa is a rising force and the new frontier of commerce and economic growth in a world whose markets are saturated and unexpandable now, especially in the Western Hemisphere. For decades, Africa has been mired in debilitating dysfunctionality. But the world is coming to the realization that that picture of Africa is no longer depicts the truth and the potential of this continent because of the slow realization that Africa, in fact, has 40% of the world's potential hydroelectric power supply. Africa has the bulk of the world's diamonds and chromium, 30% of the world's uranium in the non-communist world, 50% of the world's gold, 90% of the world's cobalt, 50% of its phosphates, 40% of, it, of its platinum, 7.5% of the world's coal, 8% of the world's known petroleum reserves, 12% of the world's natural gas, 3% of its iron ore, and millions upon millions of acres of unfarmed, arable land. The Chinese have moved into Africa in huge numbers, running massive farms to grow food to export back to feed their population in China. The Americans are in Western Africa growing rubber on large plantations to feed the factories of the West. We have 64% of the world's magnesium, 13% of the world's copper, vast bauxite, nickel, and lead reserves, 70% of the world's cocoa, for all those of you who love chocolate, and 60% of the world's coffee, 50% of the world's palm oil. But what is even more interesting is that in 2010, while the Western Hemisphere went into an economic downturn, African economies have been on average growing at a rate of 5 to 6%, at the same time when Europe has 0% growth. And even here in America, it's been a struggle to grow at all. Reports have started appearing in magazines like Bloomberg, The Economist, the UK Guardian newspaper on CNN, the World Bank's conservative reports saying that while the 1990s were the years of the Asian tiger, the next 30 years will be the years of what they're beginning to call the African lion economies. Listen to some of these ex ex excerpts from these papers. From Ghana in the west to Mozambique in the south, Africa's economies are constantly growing faster than those of almost any other region in the world today. At least a dozen have expanded by more than 6% a year for six or more years. Ethiopia, some of you may have been very young children in 1984 when Ethiopia was on the world TV screens because of a massive famine there. But Ethiopia will grow by 7.5% this year alone without a drop of oil to export. Once a byword for famine, it is now the world's 10th largest producer of livestock. A genuine middle class is emerging in Africa. According to the Standard Bank, which operates throughout Africa, 60 million African households have annual incomes greater than $3,000 at market exchange rate. By 2015, that number is expected to have reached 100 million, almost the same as India today. The World Bank states Africa can be, could be on the brink of an economic takeoff, much like China was 30 years ago. The Boston Consulting Group has coined the term African lion economies to refer to Africa's strongest economies. That's Algeria, Botswana, Egypt, Libya, um, Mauritius, Morocco, South Africa, and Tunisia. And what is most, most stunning about the African lions is that their average per capita GDP of $10,000 actually exceeds the combined per capita GDP of the so-called BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, which is $8,000, while averages as, such as these ma mask many anomalies, the, and certainly the African lands are far behind the BRIC nations on almost all broad indices. The number is nevertheless startling and encouraging. And so I stand before you to say, change your perception of Africa from that poor, 
dysfunctional continent to something new that is rising up on the soil of Africa. I don't know whether you've ever heard the story of two salesmen, shoe salesmen who were sent to a country to try and grow markets in that country. And when they went and surveyed this country, one of them wrote back to his organization, to his, you know, his, his business and said, coming back home, no economic opportunities here. Nobody wears shoes. But the second salesman wrote back home having seen the same things. And he said, send 1,000 pair of shoes. Nobody wears shoes here. Great economic opportunities. This is Africa today. So change your perceptions. But secondly, change your perceptions of Africa as a continent in need of a continuing stream of Western theologians and teachers going out to disciple the African church that is often stereotyped as a mile wide and an inch deep and perceive it as a continent where a new theology and a new expression of faith is arising to complement perspectives the Western church desperately needs. The African church is thriving and growing, strong and fast maturing. New indigenous, indigenously relevant expressions of faith are being explored. And there is an awakening awareness that the classical cultural interpretations of theology that have for centuries been taught in the West are first and foremost just that, cultural. A cultural interpretation that is not always sufficiently examined, has not always sufficiently examined its own cultural blind spots or taken into perspective its own captivity to Western linear logic, to rationalism, and to the Enlightenment thinking. A cultural theology that has often portrayed itself as the only valid, true, correct, supracultural theology and is changing to one that has in fact made no attempt to listen to the emerging voices of Christian reflection from the Southern Hemisphere. Change your perspective about theology. As it is, our understanding of Christian theology can no longer be centered on classical Western thinking and interpretation, but, but must now allow a greater voice to the definitions and understandings of faith from the Southern Hemisphere. You see, at the beginning of the last century, 75% of Christendom lived in the Northern Hemisphere, in what we sometimes call the Western Hemisphere. Western thought forms, Western questions, Western theologies dominated our understanding of what it means to be Christian. Very little room was given to the thought that in fact all exegesis is in large measure cultural first and foremost. Today, 75% of Christians in the world live in the Southern Hemisphere, in the majority world. Christianity can no longer be seen to be a Western religion dominated by Western questions and Western definitions because only 25% of the world Christians live in the, in, in the minority world, in the Western Hemisphere. Theology must have a Southern voice. And I kid you not, the church in the Southern Hemisphere reads the Bible very differently from the church in the Western Hemisphere. So change your perceptions of Africa and start listening to the theology that is arising out of that continent and the other continents in the Southern Hemisphere. Enrich your own theology by listening to our understanding of who God is and how he has revealed himself to us. For a college like this that has stood in some senses at the forefront as a visionary for missions and the preparation of missionaries to go out into the world, Wheaton has no future if it does not listen to the South and the theology of the South. And if it does not find expression within the Southern Hemisphere, if it does not locate itself to the Southern Hemisphere, then it will become a diminishing voice of the voice of the Western Hemisphere Church, where only 25% at present of Christians in the world live today. But thirdly, change your perceptions 
of African missions from the continent that continues to need mission workers and short-term missioners into a continent that has awakened to the global call to send missionaries worldwide, and especially to the Western Hemisphere. The focus of much of Western missions has been to the unreached people groups of the world and to the 1040 window. The focus of the Southern Hemisphere churches is to reach back and revitalize the faith of the Western Hemisphere countries and church. The day of mission programs driven from the West, exporting programs from the West are over. What we want now is partners who will work alongside us as equals to reach the world with the gospel. The gospel is doing better in the Southern Hemisphere than in much of the Western world, particularly Europe. And we are now engaging in reverse missions to revitalize the churches in the Western Hemisphere. We are sending missionaries to the West, not to the 1040 window, not even to the unreached people groups, but first and foremost to the West. Missionaries from the Southern Hemisphere to Spain, to Italy, to Germany, to England, and even here in the USA. Our own church has planted a church in Germany. We're working on planting a second church in Frankfurt. We're working on planting a church in New Zealand. And within the next five years, we'll be planting a church here in the US. And these are not churches to reach the diaspora of Africans who are living in America. These are churches to reach the natives of America, not the Africans in America. And as you change your perception of the church in the Southern Hemisphere, then open up yourself to a new way of doing missions that is partnering with what used to be the old mission field. Together, let us explore a way, a new way of doing missions that means reading the scriptures together as we listen to one another, writing books and commentaries together, and not allowing the domination of Western thinking alone. And as we work together, write together, and learn to do missions in a new way together, honor the local indigenous church as the best vehicle and interpreter of its own culture, without needing to design and import programs from the better resourced Western partner. It's a new day, my friends, and the world has changed. How will we do this? I want to very quickly just give you what I believe are five values that you must embrace if ever you're going to continue having an impact on the Southern Hemisphere Church. And for those of you who have a passion for Africa and for other parts of the world in the Southern Hemisphere, these are vital. Let me begin by reading a text of scripture in, you know, my African translation. You've heard this, but you've not heard this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's that passage where Paul talks about the body of Jesus Christ. Let me read it with Southern eyes for you. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the American church should say, because I am not an African, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the Canadian church should say, because I'm not Asian, I do not belong to the body, it would not cease for that reason to be part of the body. If the whole body were European, where would the sense of fun be? <laughs> And if the whole body were African, where would the sense of order and time be? <laughs> but in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them just as he wanted them to be. If we were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The Canadian church cannot say to the Asian church, I don't need you. And the European church cannot say to the African church, I don't need you. On the contrary, the Asian parts that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the African parts that we think are less honorable should be treated with special modesty, special honor. And the Latin American parts that seem unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while the presentable parts, like the big and wealthy American church, need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that seem to lack it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. 
If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. I think this text needs to become the operative text on how we do missions in our world today. Five values that I draw from it, just very quickly to mention them. The first is that missions must be founded on the knowledge that we belong and we are one in Christ. There is a relationship, a vital relationship that drives us forward. And the way we begin to do missions is by recognizing that we are in an eternal relationship with one another. The voice of the Southern Church cries out to the church in the Northern Hemisphere, please be friends to us first before you try and fix us. It's about relationships. And it begins with the fact that we are members of one body. We have a vital relationship that we cannot even begin to question. But secondly, ultimately, the mature church is the interdependent church, not the independent church. If the African church ever comes to a place where we say, we have been in existence long enough, we now belong to ourselves, we're mature, we're independent, it will not be the church of Jesus Christ. At our greatest level of maturity as the African church, we must be interdependent on the body of Christ. We belong together. Now, we know in Africa that we need the American church to be able to do that which the Lord has called us. But I wonder how many American churches know that they need the African church. Because so often they operate as though they are mature, they don't need anybody else. Why would the African church want to come and plant churches here in America? We don't need them. We're doing quite fine on our own. Wrong. That is not the church of Jesus Christ. We are the body. We will always need one another as organs within the body. Thirdly, every organ in the body gives to the rest of the body and receives from the other organs in the body. That's what we call reciprocity. The day of missions that was caricatured by this image, if it works in the West, exported to the rest, is not how the body functions. In all our missions ventures, we must build in reciprocity. Dependency that we're so afraid of is fomented or is, is formed in a body that gives and gives and gives but refuses to receive back in response. And where an organ in the body cannot receive back, then it forces the rest of the body to become dependent on it. It's a power play. This is not the body of Christ. We must build in reciprocity into the task of missions. When you send out people, receive people. When you have great ideas to share with others, then be open to hearing the great ideas that come from others. There's no more if it works in the West, export it to the rest. Those days are gone. Fourthly, there must be a sense of mutual respect for one another. Because you see, my brothers, if God, in God's economy, it is the parts that seem to be disorganized, small, feeble, that are to be given special modesty and honor, God's economy is upside down. We look at the big, you know, obvious, clear, visible churches around the world and we give them great honor. And God says, no, those are not the ones who receive the honor. It's a fledgling little church in Japan that nobody thinks to consult on church growth. That's where the honor belongs. And so when we approach other centers of the Christian faith and churches from around the world, we must always approach them with a sense of respect. Because in God's economy, even though they be small, even though they don't seem to be where we are, they are vital to the well-being of the whole body. And then the fifth value that is to help us navigate what it means to do missions in a new world today is that we must always be willing to learn. The posture we take as we enter other cultures must be a posture of learning. The question you ask when you go overseas is not the arrogant question that is often asked, how can I help you? What an arrogant question that is. What makes you think that you can help me? 
What makes you think that you're in a position of power such that that you can come into my context and begin to offer to help? The right question to ask is, can you teach me? And as I put myself in a posture of learning, then your host will invite you to teach them back in return. And the mutuality that is developed there, the reciprocity that is developed there, is that both of you learn. You do not walk into a context and ask a question, how can we help you? That is an arrogant question. The question to ask is, please help me learn. Teach me as you enter another culture. Wherever you go around the world, and people love to teach the one who asks that question. And then you open up conversation. You have the power to influence because you have entered the culture in the posture of learning. So my dear friends, the world is change, changing. You're the generation that is going to have to work this out. May God give you wisdom and grace as you go out into the world around you as a new generation of missioners and missionaries and Christians. I want to pray with us. Would you bow your head with me as we pray? Father, these are big and weighty words and themes that we talk about here. But I pray that your spirit would give us understanding as we try and shift from the old model of missions, the old paradigms, the old way of doing things, and shift to a much more humble way that builds in reciprocity and humility into the very task of missions and enables us to be the body of Christ, every center of the world contributing to the greater good of the whole church worldwide, every center being willing and humble to learn from others, that we do not dominate others with our theology and our understanding, but that we're willing to learn and to grow, that we're not afraid of each other, but instead we invite each other to walk together for the good of the gospel, for the spread of the kingdom. May your spirit rest upon your people here, Lord, what a significant place this is that is Wheaton, that for years and years and years has been engaged in the task of missions. May it be that this generation will navigate a turn that will continue to have impact for the next 100, 200 years of Wheaton's history. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.